I'm Regine Lieb Shepherd, and I'm originally from Bay City, Michigan. And upon graduating from Central Michigan University with a degree in elementary education, I had the opportunity to travel for 10 years with the International Educational and Musical Performing Group Up With People. And uh, that happens to be where I met my husband. And we lived in Tucson, Arizona for 12 years prior to moving to North Platte, Nebraska. And it was my husband's position at Great Plains Regional Medical Center that brought us to North Platte. And we've been living there for 14 years now. And it has been the most wonderful community in which to raise our two boys. We have a son, Breton, who is now a sophomore at Nebraska Wesleyan University. So we are always looking for wonderful opportunities to head this direction to see him also. And uh, then our son, our younger son, Colin, is a senior at North Platte High School. So as parents, we're kind of going through, you know, the last of everything this year. Um, well, I think, you know, from the eighth grade, I can remember, I just, I wanted to be an elementary uh, school teacher. And so I was always kind of on that track from eighth grade, just knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and attending Central Michigan University was just a wonderful experience. And well, I would say yes, definitely. Uh, Nebraska and the Plains have had a tremendous influence on my writing, especially because both books that I had the opportunity to write are Nebraska books. C is for Corn Husker and Nebraska Alphabet and Husker Numbers, a uh, Nebraska counting book. Of course, they highlight the treasures that our great state has to offer. So uh, definitely Nebraska and the Plains uh, have been a huge influence on my writing. I would have to say my parents have been a huge influence on my writing. Uh, my parents still live in Bay City, Michigan, and uh, I just remember as a child in our family uh, a little verse, and I incorporated that into the dedication of C is for Cornhusker. It says, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And uh, I've had a lot of experience with rejection letters through my writing over the years, and uh, that little verse just um, always held a, a special place in my heart and in my life. That verse has proved to be a, a very wise bit of information that my parents passed on to me. Well, I think the very first thing I can remember writing, I was eight years old and I wrote a little poem for my great-grandmother. And uh, I have an aunt that I remember thought that writing was just wonderful and she took it and kind of hand painted it on a, a wooden plaque and uh, that hung in my grandmother's home for many many years and eventually you know has made its way back to me but I think just that gesture that my aunt uh, felt that was just a special piece of writing that she took the time to do that I really think that kind of influenced me from such a young age that I someday wanted to be a writer. You know, I have to say, uh, this is probably kind of a little off uh, the question, but for me, uh, my inspiration comes best when I have absolutely nothing else to think about. You know, when I've checked everything off that to-do list and that is out of my mind, you know, then I feel my mind is cleared and, and ready to write. And uh, a, a lot of my inspiration for both C is for Cornhusker and Husker Numbers came uh, during my afternoon walks especially in the summer I'd take my one hour walk and keep my little notebook by my side and as I was walking I'd jot down thoughts and so I'd have to say my inspiration you know came through through my daily afternoon walks. Well again I suppose just anything to do with Nebraska kind of the topic gravitates uh, you know I gravitate toward and again just because both books um, Sleeping Bear Press uh, is known for their two-tier format. So their authors often write in rhyming verse to appeal to younger children, and then in the margin of each uh, page is an expository text of factual information to complement each rhyming verse, and that's to appeal to older children and adults alike. And uh, so I guess I kind of have the best of both worlds, being able to, you know, write for children and write for adults. I'm a late night person, and that doesn't always work the best as a substitute teacher, but uh, I just find that I work best at night. Again, I think it's when 
the household is quiet and everyone's asleep and uh, that's just when I do my best thinking and as a matter of fact a lot of the thoughts for both books came in the middle of the night so I always kept a little notebook by the bedside and uh, would often just pop out of bed out of nowhere and just jot down a thought and well, <clears throat> style and voice, I guess I'm kind of going back to one of the questions you, you asked a little earlier. And again, um, I've always been interested in rhyming verse. Mm -hmm. And I think when I found Sleeping Bear Press and found that they, um, a lot of their books are done in rhyming verse, and again, with the expository text in the margin, because I love to do research also, I just felt it was a perfect um, match. And again, just to have the best of both worlds to write for children and to write for adults. Um, it's been a fun opportunity. I guess I would say to the audiences um, through both books, again, children and adults alike, I um, have just been so thrilled to be able to share the unique treasures that Nebraska has to offer. Um, you know, there was no difficulty writing a book full of treasures and then moving on to a second book, and I think there could be a third and a fourth and so forth. Um, we have so many incredible treasures within this state, and my job as the author of the Nebraska books uh, was to, um, you know, what, what makes Nebraska unique from the other 49 states. So it was so much fun to research and and find just a wealth of information out there. And so I guess that's what I want most to get across to my audiences is how very fortunate we are um, as Nebraskans to live in this incredible state with all its treasures. Well, and I probably touched upon that a little bit already, but again, I think that verse that my parents taught me. And I had a situation, and I know I shared this last year, where I had submitted a manuscript and um, it was rejected and I thought, all right, my parents told me, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And I continued to send it out for four more years, you know, to different publishing companies around the world. And so I have a box of 100 rejection letters. I always keep those. It just reminds me of how truly blessed I feel to have had the opportunity to write both Nebraska books. Um, you know, but then many years later, we happened to find uh, a book on the shelf with the similar title to the manuscript I had submitted and um, you know I know I shared this story with you but when I looked at who had published it it was the very first publishing company I had ever sent my manuscript to and um, you know and looking back it took me a while to get over that experience um, I almost gave up writing for a while um, but again that little verse or voice of my parents came back saying keep on going you know don't give up and I look back and I think if I had given up I would never ever have had this incredible opportunity to write both books so well I currently have a manuscript that I have submitted to a publishing company in Michigan um, and uh, just kind of waiting to hear uh, they deal a lot with regional material so it is a uh, uh, actually a, a song based on a song for children, a counting song, and uh, to highlight the special, uh, I want to say the state symbols of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just kind of waiting to hear about that. Sleeping Bear Press has started a new series, an international series, and uh, they have a book, uh, D is for Dancing Dragon, a Chinese alphabet. S is for Shamrock, an Irish alphabet. They have one for um, England, and I think they're adding Japan and Mexico. And uh, I would love the opportunity to write one of their books from the international series. Looking back on experiences I had traveling with Up With People, um, I've currently submitted something for the Netherlands. I just think the Netherlands has incredible visual things too, you know, with the windmills and the canals and the wooden shoes and the tulips and the list kind of goes on and on. So I think there'd be a wealth of information to share with children on that country. So those are a couple of things I have in the works, but we'll see where it leads. Good evening. My name is Meredith McGowan. I am the curator of the Heritage Room. I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John H. Ames Reading Series. Um, I'd like to give a special welcome to the UNL Children's Literature class that's here this evening. And I'd also like to thank the Daily Nebraskan for featuring um, the program in the, in the newspaper today. That was pretty exciting. 
Um, we're excited that this reading series has been in existence for more than 20 years. Um, this is the 174th Ames reading this evening. So I'm glad you're here with us to, to enjoy it. Um, I just want to remind you too that the Ames Re reading series is broadcast on Five City TV and that they also do provide copies for checkout as well. So um, lots of ways to see these programs. We are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection that's dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. About 13,000 volumes here in the collection and some 3,000 authors are represented. It is a representative collection. Obviously, if we tried to put everything in here, it wouldn't, wouldn't fit in the room. We wouldn't be sitting here, I guess. We'd be filled up with volumes. Um, we'd like to invite you back during regular public service hours. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3 and Sundays from 2 to 5. Um, obviously, we have the, the 13,000 volumes, but we also have artwork around the room. Uh, sculptures by John, Paul Johnsgarg, um, Lauren Isley's dollhouse, and a lot of other things to see too. <clears throat> We'd also like to thank the Liter Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. We're able to bring special programs like this to you through their, um, their special efforts um, to establish an endowment for us. Tonight our reader is Regine Shepherd, Regine Lieb Shepherd. She's a Michigan native who moved to North Platte with her family late in 1994, I believe. She has a degree in elementary education, and she received that from Central Michigan University. Um, she moved here and put that degree to use. She's a substitute teacher in North Platte, and I think substitutes quite a bit at different levels, so some of you can, can um, empathize with that. Um, I know that she really likes to share literature with the students that she sees during her substitute days. And I'm sure that she enjoys sharing her new book, Husker Numbers, a Nebraska number book. And she's also the author of another book that's, um, I think, for all ages, C is for Cornhusker, a Nebraska alphabet. That book won the Nebraska Farm Bureau's first Children's Agricultural Book of the Year award in 2006. And then when I was making sure on the internet that it was a 2006 award winner, I noticed that she'd won the 2007 award also for Husker Numbers. So um, the Farm Bureau people like her books, I believe. We're happy to have Regine Shepard here with us. If you could help me welcome her, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. There it is. Well, good evening and welcome to the Ames Reading Series. I just want to begin by saying a heartfelt thank you to Meredith and to the Bennett Martin Library uh, for hosting me this evening in the beautiful Heritage Room. Uh, as Meredith said, I had an opportunity to be here last year. I just loved my visit so much, so I was honored to be asked a second time, especially to be here to celebrate um, March 1st is Nebraska's 141st birthday. So uh, since I had the opportunity to write two books about Nebraska, it's fun to be here so close to um, our state's birthday celebration. Uh, last year when I was here, I shared the book C is for Cornhusker, a Nebraska alphabet. And this book was published in um, 2004 by Sleeping Bear Press as part of one of their series called Discover America State by State. They began the Discover America State by State series in 1999 with their very first alphabet book, M is for Mitten, a Michigan alphabet. And they finished the series in 2005 with A is for Aloha, a Hawaiian alphabet. So it was a six-year process for them to complete all 50 state alphabet books. And there is a different author and a different illustrator for each state book. And uh, I was just lucky enough to be chosen as the Nebraska author. Uh, one of the very first questions I am usually asked is, how was I chosen? And I happened to be home visiting my parents in Michigan when I came across M is for Mitten, a Michigan alphabet. And I have a copy right up here. And when I saw this in the bookstore, I thought, ah, oh, that's a book about 
my state where I was born and raised, so I decided to purchase a copy. And I really didn't get a chance to look through it very much, but when I got back to North Platte, I happened to find the book Alice for Lone Star, a Texas alphabet in our local Walden books. And uh, when I looked at the two of them, I thought, well, they remind me of one another, kind of the same format. And I looked inside to see that they had both been published by Sleeping Bear Press. And that was a company I had never heard of before. So I did a little bit of research, and I thought, you know, if there's a Michigan book and a Texas book, I wonder if they're planning a Nebraska book. So I contacted the company, and they said, yes, they were planning a Nebraska book. They'd had many uh, authors submit their work, but they had not chosen anything yet. So if I was interested, I should hurry and send in some of my writing. And I did, and about six months later, I received a... Uh, the exciting news that I was going to have the chance to write the Nebraska book. So it's been quite an adventure. It has been a lifelong dream of mine. I didn't think it was ever going to happen. So I feel very blessed to have the chance to represent our great state in this series. Um, tonight I would like to share with you the other thing I wanted to show you. I know every time I move from the microphone that's not good, is it? Is it okay? I like to move around a lot. What I wanted to show you and, and pass around, after Sleeping Bear Press completed the entire series, they put together this little postcard which shows the cover of all 50 state alphabet books. So I will pass that around. A lot of times people, if they were born and raised in another state or have a special connection to another state, they like to see what the um, title is. And so I will send that around. And I do have some of the other state books up here on the floor. Um, tonight, I would like to share with you my newest book. It was just published in September, uh, again by Sleeping Bear Press, and the title, Husker Numbers, a Nebraska Number Book. And uh, this is part of Sleeping Bear Press's newest series called Count Your Way Across the USA. We are the 20th book in this series. We were the 45th book in the Alphabet series, so we moved up a little bit. Um, but Sleeping Bear Press does have a number of states to complete uh, before the series will be done. And uh, they went back to each author and illustrator of the Alphabet book to have a second opportunity. So uh, I don't think that happens very often to that many authors where you just happen to be... Uh, in the right place at the right time to have the chance to write two different books. So again, I feel very blessed. Tonight I would like to read just the rhyming verses to you. If you've ever had a chance to look at both books, you'll notice that they are written in a very similar format. Sleeping Bear Press is known for something called a two-tier format. So they like their authors to write in rhyming verse so that the verses appeal to younger children. And then in the margin of each page, there is an expository text of factual information to go along with each rhyming verse. And there's never enough time to read all of that information, but tonight I would like to share maybe a, pay, I mean a, a sentence or two with you of some of the factual information in the margin. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and we have uh, on the PowerPoint there, I just wanted you to be able to see Sandy Appeloff's incredible illustrations. And a little bit later, I will tell you a little more about Sandy Appeloff, the illustrator of both books. Um, just an incredible, incredible lady that uh, I had not met previously until we were paired up to do this together. And we really didn't have much collaboration um, I should say we secretly uh, collaborated. I don't think Sleeping Bear Press perhaps has their authors and illustrators work real closely together. Um, as the author writes the words, then the illustrator takes those words and makes it his or her own interpretation. But um, we kind of secretly called one another and, and collaborated a bit because I felt we were doing this great book about Nebraska, or I should say a book about our great state of Nebraska, and that we needed to collaborate with one another on what treasures our state has to offer the rest of the world. So um, I need your help tonight, though. And I thought, since I'm a substitute teacher, 
and uh, my very favorite class in college was children's literature. I thought that I could depend on the children's literature class students to come and help me tonight. So when I speak to students, I like to keep them actively involved. And last year when I was here to share C is for Cornhusker, uh, we put together a giant puzzle. And you've probably all seen these floor puzzles, but what I like to do with C is for Cornhusker is I read each rhyming verse. I have the children come up as I read letter A. The person who has letter A comes and puts that in the giant puzzle. And then I tried to share with them that for me in writing C is for Cornhusker, I felt like it was very much a giant puzzle, putting those pieces together and trying to get them fit to fit. And some pieces fit more easily than others, and I then share four quick examples with them of how that puzzle came together. Um, tonight I have some Husker footballs and uh, I thought since we're here in Husker territory that this this would work out. All right, I'm walking around. Sorry, I don't have the mic. Anybody, would you like? I think I'll just pass. Can I do that? Just take one and we'll see how far they go. Um, and as I read the rhyming verse, if you have the number, numbered football that I'm reading about, if you'll just come up and place it on our miniature stadium here. <clears throat> All right. Whoops, my glasses. Husker Numbers, a Nebraska number book, written by Regine Lieb Shepherd and illustrated by Sandy Appeloff. I grabbed the wrong book without my notes. Let's see. Do we get all the footballs passed out or a few more to go, I guess? I guess there's a few more. The other thing I'm going to ask you to do with me, uh, again, when I read to children, uh, one of the very first things I told them when I received the black and white copy um, prior to the book being published or printed, my job was to go through and to make sure there were not any last minute mistakes. And so the very first thing I wanted to do was to count the items on each page and to make sure that they matched with the number. So I always have children count with me and um, it, it's funny because many times I'll turn the page and will have forgotten to count and the children are right there to remind me, Mrs. Shepherd, we forgot to count. So we go back and count. So tonight I am going to ask if you would count with me and a little later I'll explain why, why we're counting also. All right, did we get them all passed out? Across Nebraska, we'll count our way and begin with number one as the yellow-bellied meadowlark wakes up the morning sun. One majestic chimney rock, tall and proud it stands, a welcome sight for pioneers who journeyed across the land. And if you have number one, I'll just let you come. Oh, that worked out. <laughs> right up in front. Uh, rising from the prairie like a towering clay and sandstone sculpture is one of Nebraska's most recognizable landmarks, Chimney Rock. This awe-inspiring site was the road sign most often mentioned in the journals of the adventurous pioneers who traveled west along the Mormon, Oregon, and California trails in the mid-1800s. And again, there's a lot more information in the margin, but I'm just going to pick out a couple of things to share with you and uh, easy to count number one. Number two, high in the canopy treehouse we'll have a bird's eye view of white-tailed deer playing hide and seek. Let's count them, there are two. An outdoor tree adventure awaits you at Arbor Day Farm in Nebraska City where entertaining exhibits educate visitors about the importance of trees, including the Eastern Cottonwood Nebraska State Tree. 
Step back in time to meet Mr. Morton, the father of Arbor Day, as he welcomes you to his farm to share his lifelong mission of inspiring people to plant, nurture, and celebrate trees. And there you can climb to the top of the 50-foot high canopy treehouse and view the forest below. And we'll count our two little white-tailed deer. One, two. <laughs> Number three. It's three for the stories tall within this barn so round. Come take a peek inside. There are treasures to be found. If you step inside Nebraska's largest barn and one of the largest in the nation near Red Cloud, uh, this ma massive structure is unique in the fact that it is a perfect circle, 130 feet in diameter. And the barn is three stories tall with the bottom level for animals, the second floor for machinery, and the top floor or the loft for hay. And then we count the floors. One, two, three. Number four. <clears throat> four ancient Indian petroglyphs preserved for all to see. But how and when they first were etched remains a mystery. Named for the huge sandstone cavity that is the main geologic feature of the area, Indian Cave State Park can be found in southeastern Nebraska near the mighty Missouri River. The ancient Native American picture writings etched on the walls of the cave, known as petroglyphs, are the only known example of their kind in Nebraska. One, two, three, four. Number five. Let's join five nature lovers along the cowboy trail. Can you spot the ground squirrel, the rabbit, and the quail? And the Cowboy Recreation and Nature Trail is the longest recreational rail-to-trail project in the United States. This railroad corridor that once created and supplied settlements across northern Nebraska is now a 320-mile hiking, biking, and equestrian trail passing through some of Nebraska's most scenic and natural landscapes. And we'll count our five nature lovers. One, two, three, four, five. Number six, they border our great state, so wave and say hello to our six friendly neighbors who are very nice to know. And this page talks, of course, about our six surrounding neighbors and especially their state nicknames. Um, so, for example, meet our South Dakota neighbors in the Mount Rushmore state, nicknamed for the nation's greatest mountain carving, which celebrates four honored American presidents. Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Lincoln. Number seven. Oh, we forgot to count. I forgot to count. Sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Number seven. Seven black tailed prairie dogs all bark a warning sound as they hurry and they scurry to their burrows underground. And uh, this is actually one of my favorite stories <clears throat> in the book. On September 7th, 1804, while on their legendary journey across the continent, Captain Lewis and Clark first discovered prairie dogs while passing near present-day Lynch, Nebraska. Near Old Baldy, a geological landmark, members of the expedition spent an entire day trying to coax these barking squirrels out of their underground burrows. They eventually captured one of the furry critters and shipped it to Washington, D.C., where it became the first prairie dog ambassador to meet President Thomas Jefferson. I love that story. All right, we'll count our seven prairie dogs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Number eight. On the first day of summer, Swedish dancers celebrate by circling round the maypole for a festive number eight. In the mid-1800s, the promise of inexpensive prime farmland drew thousands of people to Nebraska from all over the world. 
Nebraskans are proud of their diverse cultural heritage, and this pride is reflected today in the many festivals celebrated throughout the state, such as the Midsummer Swedish Festival, which follows a tradition of commemorating the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. And our eight dancers around the maypole. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Number nine. Can you count the channel catfish in their playful school of nine as they nibble and they splash at the end of the fishing line? In 1997, a class of fourth graders from Valley, Nebraska got the legislature to change the process of selecting Nebraska state symbols. The governor, not the legislature, now had the authority to designate state symbols. And the first symbol chosen by this new process was on September 13, 1997, when Governor Ben Nelson declared the channel catfish to be the official state fish. And it just so happens tomorrow we are heading to Valley, Nebraska to help celebrate the 10th year uh, that this school um, founded, or, or the historic uh, time period 10 years ago when the the students made this happen, so we're looking forward to our visit. And they're hoping to invite back some of the um, adults now who were children 10 years ago in that fourth grade class. I forgot to count again. You have to remind me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <coughs> Number 10. Ten cozy cabin cabooses all make a comfy bed. So grab your blanket and pillow. Come rest your sleepy head. Climb aboard for a unique adventure at Two Rivers State Recreational Area near Venice, Nebraska. Although cabooses are no longer used by most railroads, they do recall a bygone era when the railroads helped settle the West and brought a great nation together. And I just thought for children, what a fun place to camp out for the night. Has anyone ever been there? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Ten cabooses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Number eleven. Eleven colorful kites paint rainbows across the sky as they dance upon the wind how we love to watch them fly. Each Labor Day weekend, the skies over Callaway dance alive with a rainbow of colors when kite flyers from all over the world gather to fly some amazing one-of-a-kind kites. Two of Nebraska's most abundant natural resources, a constant prairie wind and the wide open spaces, have made Callaway the kite flight capital of Nebraska as officially designated by the Nebraska Legislature. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Number twelve. Twelve faithful frontier soldiers are marching once again for living history days at Old Fort Atkinson. Step back in time and experience life as it was from 1820 to 1827 at Fort Atkinson, the first U.S. military post west of the Missouri River. During Living History Days, the fort comes to life again as volunteer reenactors demonstrate military activities and daily chores. And uh, this Frontier Army post was very important to the early fur trade, the boats on the Missouri River, and Native American relations. It was also the site of the first school, library, farm, sawmill, and hospital in what later became the state of Nebraska. And on this page, I like how Sandy Appeloff grouped them by twos. So I always get children to practice their counting by twos. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Number 13. Watch out down below as they're swimming overhead, for 13 hungry sharks are waiting to be fed. Come take an underwater stroll on the ocean floor as you wind your way through a 70-foot-long zigzag acrylic tunnel. 
Here, the sharks are so close, you can see their tails swish and their teeth gnash as they swim over you, alongside you, and directly at you. You are in the shark tunnel at the bottom of a 17-foot deep exhibit, which contains over 900,000 gallons of circulating salt water. All right, this one always gets a little tricky to count. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Number fourteen. Fourteen fancy postcards with their heart design have lovingly been sent from the town of Valentine. Love is in the air, especially on February 14th in Valentine, Nebraska, when thousands of postcards and Valentine greetings are mailed all over the world from the heart city of America. And then it goes on to explain, especially to children, how they can do this. There's the steps in the book to tell them. 14 postcards, this one gets tricky too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Number fifteen. Fifteen American flags that wave so gallantly for veterans at Fort McPherson, a national cemetery. Located in the picture, picturesque Platte River Valley near Maxwell, Fort McPherson National Cemetery is the only national cemetery in Nebraska and one of the most beautiful in the nation. It was established in 1873 on a 107-acre tract of Fort McPherson, a military post which once provided protection to settlers of the American West. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And the tall flag flies 24 hours a day. Number 20. Twenty busy honeybees are buzzing to and fro in the tall prairie grasses where the wildflowers grow. First suggested by school children from Auburn, the honeybee was adopted as Nebraska's official state insect in 1975. The production of honey is one of Nebraska's great industries that developed during the covered wagon era. The bee's ability to <coughs> pollinate crops is extremely valuable to farmers, and the honeybee is recognized as a prime asset of the state. And I like how they are grouped in fives. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Number twenty-five. Twenty-five lucky pennies can all be traded for one shiny Nebraska quarter at your favorite candy store. Chimney Rock, a, a familiar symbol that has decorated everything from spoons to license plates, was silhouetted in the national spotlight April 2006 when the U.S. Mint's 50 State Quarters Program released its 37th commemorative quarter to honor the state of Nebraska. Nicknamed the Cornhusker State, Nebraska was admitted into the Union on March 1, 1867, becoming our nation's 37th state. And it was on June 1, 2005, that Nebraska Governor Dave Heineman announced his recommendation of the Chimney Rock design. This quarter is a reminder of the vitality, spirit, and determination that has long been a trademark of our state. Grouped again in fives. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. <clears throat> Number thirty. Out yonder in the sand hills with its panoramic view, thirty cows are grazing beneath the skies so blue. The beef cattle industry is the single largest industry in Nebraska, where cattle outnumber people at a ratio of four to one. 
Cherry County, the number one beef cow county in the nation, is located in the Sand Hills region, the largest sand dune formation in the Western Hemisphere, where 19,000 square miles of rolling grass-covered hills sit atop the Ogallala Aquifer, the nation's largest underground water supply. This location, with its abundance of water and over 700 species of grasses, makes the Sand Hills one of the prime cattle raising and cattle grazing areas in the United States. <coughs> Grouped again in fives. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. <coughs> Number 40. 40 golden bales of hay that stretch so far and wide across the farmer's rolling fields in the peaceful countryside. The Cornhusker State was once mistakenly called the Great American Desert because it seemed flat, sandy, treeless, and unfit for cultivation. However, settlers soon helped transform the land into an agricultural oasis that would eventually become a breadbasket for the nation. Fertile soil, abundant water resources, and advanced farming methods all contribute to Nebraska's rank as a national leader in crop production, especially corn. All right, this page challenges children. It's grouped by fours. Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, 36, 40. Number 50. 50 marvelous marbles from a time of long ago. Cat's eyes, swirls, and rainbows, and even some that glow. If you think you've lost your marbles, you might find them again at Lee's legend Legendary Marbles in York, a unique museum dedicated to a favorite childhood pastime of yesteryear. While decades ago, children would take their pouch full of Aggies, Alleys, Peewees, and Shooters and play for keeps on sidewalks and playgrounds, today adults seek out those same marbles for one of the fastest growing hobbies, marble collecting. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. And number 100. Just close your eyes and make a wish neath the vast Nebraska sky as 100 magical stars twinkle like diamonds on high. Grab your telescope and travel to north central Nebraska where you will find a star-filled sky in as dark a place as you can get. At Merritt Reservoir, you can join stargazers for a stunning view of the heavens at the annual Nebraska Star Party. It has gained a reputation as being one of the premier stargazing events in the country due to the extremely dark skies of this remote and sparsely populated region of the Sandhills. Under the vast Nebraska sky, the stars are just waiting to be noticed and wished upon. Starlight, star bright. Thank you for taking the journey with me across the great state of Nebraska. <clears throat> Oh, yes, thank you for asking. She said, do we count the last one? I always challenge children to try and find a copy in their school library or in the public library and that they get to count the number 100 on their own. So I often have children when I go back as a substitute teacher the next time, Mrs. Shepard, I counted and all 100 stars are there. So, <laughs> um, oh, I have so many stories to share with you and I, I definitely want to leave some time for your questions. Um, one of the first questions I'm asked is how did I decide what numbers were going to be placed in the book? And um, I knew when I started writing, uh, my ultimate goal was 100 because I knew children loved to be able to say, Mrs. Shepard, I know how to count to 100 and you just see their light or their eyes uh, light up. So I knew that for me that was the ultimate goal. But knowing there could not be 100 pages in a children's book, it got a little challenging. So I knew I wanted to start with number one as one majestic chimney rock. 
Um, having seen Chimney Rock, I've always thought it looked like a number one sticking out of the ground. So for me, that was just the easiest place to start. And then I thought, all right, how do I get to 100? Well, when I discovered I was going to have the chance to write this second book, our new state quarter had just been designed and or it had been chosen and announced that Chimney Rock was going to be on the design. So I thought if I'm starting with one majestic Chimney Rock, wouldn't it be fun to go to number 25 and then show the state quarter with the Chimney Rock design and hopefully then children would make the connection, oh, isn't that the same thing I saw on page one? And then have a little bit of a better understanding of how and why Chimney Rock was chosen for our state quarter design. But after I got from 1 through 25, I thought, all right, now how do I get to 100? So my thought was, let's teach children how to count uh, by quarters. And after 25, we'll go 25, 50, 75, 100. So I thought I had everything planned, and I submitted all my work. And I received an email back from my editor, and she said, oh, well, Regine, um, that isn't one of our two formats. And I thought, oh, I didn't know there were only two formats. So somewhere along the way, I had totally missed that there were two choices in, in doing the numbers in the book. The first choice was 1 through 12, and then it skipped to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, by 10s all the way to 100. And then the second choice was the one that I used, and um, obviously it was because I could still get our state quarter in the book. But because of the layout of the children's book with the single page and the full page spread, um, there were only 21 numbers total in the book. And, you know, 21 is a, a strange number, so that's how the format got, got worked out. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Sandy Appeloff, the illustrator. Sandy Appeloff is from Falls City, Nebraska. We had never met uh, previous uh, to this experience together working on the books. She was hired by Sleeping Bear Press just as I was. We have since been to four book signings together. Um, she is just a fabulous lady. She's my age. Um, she is currently teaching. She's an instructor at Laguna Beach School of Fine Art and Design in California. This is her second year there, but she always returns home every summer to her three-generation farm. And her three-generation farm is the cover of C is for Cornhusker. And in October, we were invited to a book signing. She flew home from California uh, to kind of kick off the new book in her community. And uh, she said, Regine, would you come and, and join me? And I said, I would love to come to Falls City. I have, uh, ever since we started working together on C is for Cornhusker, wanted to see where she was born and raised. And so in October, we spent an afternoon and evening in Falls City. And it was so much fun because the book came so to life for me. She, uh, Sandy Appeloff, with her incredible illustrations, loves to illustrate using real people that she knows. So there are a lot of um, little pictures in here that uh, are her friends, her relatives, and so as we were sitting in the book signing line and people were coming through, she'd tap me on the shoulder and she'd say, you see that man coming over there? Well, you'll find him on page 30 of the book. That's oh. Mr. So-and-so, our resident cowboy. And sure enough, uh, I do need to show you this, and I don't know how easy it is to go back, so I'll just kind of hold up the book. But this gentleman from Falls City came dressed exactly like that. And as he walked through the line, I thought, boy, does he look familiar. And then Sandy said, that's because he's on page 30 of the book. So um, some of the other pictures I wanted to show you. Sandy Appeloff's mother is on the title page. This is Mildred Appeloff. And uh, kind of a fun story. I'll just share with you what a small world it truly is. Soon after C is for Cornhusker, um, was published, I received an email from a friend of mine in Finland. Uh, this was a girl that I had traveled with and up with people in International Musical Performing Group a long, long time ago. I haven't heard from her in over 
wouldn't even want to tell you, um, <laughs> 25 and even more than that years. And she just said, Regine, I hear you've written a children's book about the state of Nebraska. And she said, I think I have to have a copy. And I thought, well, that's interesting, or how nice of her. And she said, my brother was an exchange student um, in Nebraska. And so I emailed her back and I said, well, that's amazing. Was it in Lincoln or Omaha? And she said, no, it was this tiny little town in the southeastern part of the state called Falls City. Oh. Well, I emailed her back and I said, you will never believe this, Yana. I said, the illustrator is from Falls City. Her name is Sandy Appeloff. Well, Yana emailed back and she said, Regine, my brother had Mrs. Appeloff as his music teacher the entire year he was in Fall City. And she said, we all, um, or when I told Sandy, the illustrator, that, she said, everyone knew UC from Finland because at the time he was the only exchange student and first one ever from Finland. And um, so to me, that's one of the greatest small world stories that I love to share. Some of the other people in the book... On page 10 is Sandy Appeloff's best friend and her best friend's two daughters. And they were there the evening of the book signing also. And it just made me realize what an incredible illustrator Sandy is, especially to be able to do faces. Um, to me, that would be the most difficult thing. But immediately when these three walked through the line, you know, I looked and I said, you are, you're on page 10. I can identify you immediately. So um, I saw a few maybe whispers in the audience. I would imagine you recognize somebody on page 14. I did not know Sandy was doing this. So that was a total surprise when I got the black and white copy and um, turned to that page. And again, I think it's a perfect likeness of me. So. Um, and let me see, there's a few other stories. Probably the most special, um, when I told Sandy that I wanted to use stars on the final page uh, because of our Nebraska star party, she said, Regine, that would mean the world to me. She said, my father, who is no longer living, used to take us out on the family farm and share these incredible stories of the constellations. And she said, as kids, we always wondered, was dad making this up or was it for real? Yeah. And so this is her father with the three Appeloff children when they were little. So those are a few of the behind the scenes stories about Sandy and her incredible illustrations. Um, I probably, what I'd like to show you, she did give me I hate to walk away from the microphone, but I guess it's okay. Thank you. She presented me with her original watercolor painting uh, for the number 14 in the book, and then I was able to purchase the cover of Husker Numbers. So we need to get these framed, but I like to bring these around to show children what a real watercolor painting looks like and how that ends up in a children's book. She did something special too. Some of you I know were here last year when I shared some of the stories with C is for Cornhusker, but on the A page of C is for Cornhusker, all about A is for Arbor Day. She illustrated our two boys. Our son Breton is a sophomore at Nebraska Wesleyan University this year and our son Colin is a senior at North Platte High School. But again, a total surprise and it actually took us when the black and white copy came, I was so excited to go through the book and see how did she interpret my words and what illustrations does she have on each page? So I just kind of turn page after page and kind of, ooh, ah, isn't that beautiful? I went back a second time and I kind of started focusing in on details and it wasn't until the third time I went back and all of a sudden my eyes were drawn right down here. And you can imagine when I immediately realized that that was our son, Breton, and then found our son, Colin, over here. So that's a treasure that she placed in this book um, 
that I just, you know, will forever have as, as a memory of writing C.S. for Cornhusker. She again presented us with the painting. And then this one is the G page, and I have shared this story before, but I'm originally from Michigan. My grandfather was born in 1895 on a homestead in Wood River, Nebraska. At age 23, he left Nebraska and moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So my life with Grandpa was our yearly trips from Michigan to Wisconsin. But I always knew that Grandpa had been born and raised somewhere in Nebraska. Well, little did I know that someday I would end up living in Nebraska, so close to where my family roots actually began, and then have the opportunity to write a Nebraska book. But my grandfather built this home you see in the picture. It's on the G page of C.S. for Cornhusker. That home is still standing in Wood River. And I would imagine many of you, as you travel along I-80 back and forth, have passed this house. It's at mile marker 303 in the North Cornfield. So the next time you're driving that direction, look to the North Cornfield and you will see this home. It's changed a little bit since then. There's a big addition to the east of the home, and then there's a huge barn in the back, and they've added some siding and so forth. But I actually tape recorded my grandfather. Um, he would have been, well, he passed away about 18 years ago. But the year before he died, I put a tape recorder under his seat, and I said, Grandpa, uh, would you tell me some of the stories of what it was like to be born in 1895 on a homestead in Wood River, Nebraska? And he shared three of the most amazing hours of stories. And in those stories, he in great detail explained how he built his first home. And my husband and I have since stopped at this house. There's no one in the family um, that lives there anymore, no relatives, but I wanted the lady who lives there now to know a little bit about my grandfather. So I stopped at the house, knocked on the door, and um, when I got to the door, I thought, okay, great, now what do I say? And um, I said, I know this is going to sound a little strange, but my grandfather built your home in 1918. And I just wanted to share a little of the history with you. And as I started describing some of the things in her house, you could see her eyes open wider. She realized, I think this lady knows what she's talking about. So she invited me into the home. And when I looked at the staircase, well, I immediately start, started to cry because it was the same staircase my grandpa had in his own home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the house that I had spent so many years growing up in, and yet that house in Milwaukee is no longer standing. So all of a sudden I just kind of felt my grandpa's presence there in that house. And as I got talking to the lady of the house, she said, we used to have these beveled windows in this home. And I said, you did? My grandpa had beveled windows in his home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. However, no one knows when the house was torn down, whatever happened to those windows. I said, what did you do with your windows? She said, oh, years ago, we sold them to an antique dealer. Well, when I got back to North Platte, I decided to do a little research. And I found out the antique dealer was in Ravenna, Nebraska and they still had all four windows that my grandfather had uh, made with his own hands. And so I bought them back for a lot of money, but it was one of those things, a treasure I knew I had to have. So I now own four beautiful windows that my grandpa made way back in 1918 that came from that home. Um, one of the challenges, oh boy, time is just flying, isn't it? I will just quickly tell you one of the challenges in writing Husker Numbers was the title of the book. Um, when I did the first book, it was pretty easy to know that the title was going to be C is for Cornhusker because most of the authors chose this, their state nickname as the title. But with Husker Numbers, we were all left to a little more creativity to come up uh, with our own title. My first thought was Husker Numbers, um, just because of the way we were called the Cornhusker State. Sometimes that shortened to the Husker State, and I just thought it made kind of a, a, a pair. Um, but for a long time, Sleeping Bear Press uh, didn't really let me know what the title was going to be. And uh, as I noticed a lot of the other state books, counting books, there were some very clever math terms. New York is called Times Square. Um, let's see, I've got a few other examples here. Um, Texas is called Roundup. 
desert digits for Arizona. And so I started thinking, all right, is there a math term that we could use for Nebraska? So I worked for many, many months. Um, one of the ideas was prime numbers, thinking that we would highlight our, our cattle industry, our beef industry. And, um, but their New Hampshire's book is called Primary Numbers, so I think that was a little too close. Uh, another idea was numbers by the bushel, thinking bushel is a math term and we have so much corn and so forth. Um, but in the end, Sleeping Bear Press uh, voted that Husker Numbers was the best fit. They felt that anyone picking up C is for Corn Husker and Husker Numbers would definitely be able to put the two together even if they weren't from the state of Nebraska. Um, so that was the, the, the title that we all went with. <laughs> all right, well, I guess I would just like to end. Um, it's a verse that I wrote in C is for Cornhusker. Um, it's kind of the finale to the book, but I just changed a couple of words to kind of rewrite it for Husker numbers. And this is just a, a thank you to all of you for being here tonight. Um, you have touched my life just through walking through the door tonight and being here to share Husker numbers with me. So this last verse is for you. It says, As I've traveled the state of Nebraska and journeyed one, two, three, I've discovered so many treasures, so much to do and see. But of all the wonderful sights and the history that abounds, the spirit of Nebraskans is the greatest treasure I've found. And uh, I especially wish you elementary school teachers um, the best in your career. It's an awesome career to have. Uh, you daily will be affecting the lives of children in ways that you don't even know are possible. So thank you again to everyone for being here tonight to share this evening with me.